Welcome to the MSP Experience Game Changers, innovative thinkers in the MSP space. This is a limited edition series presented by Axiant, your trusted partner for comprehensive BCDR solutions for MSPs. I am your host, Robert Chiaffi, the CTO and co-founder of Progressive Computing, an MSP based in New York, established in 1993. What is Game Changers? Well, simply put, Game Changers is a video series designed to bring some of the most innovative thinkers in the MSP space into a one-on-one -on -one conversation with another MSP leader. Our topics are carefully cultivated to push the envelope for MSPs, to discuss real-world problems that we're facing, and to hear from industry experts on how to solve them in interesting and innovative ways. Now, today's episode is AI, artificial intelligence, fad or a new world order. And our special guest is Bob Miller from Global Data Systems. Welcome, Bob, and thank you for joining me. Uh, would you mind just uh, giving a quick elevator pitch or introduction for you and your company to the audience? Yeah, yeah sure. So I am the COO of Global Data Systems. Um, we are a managed service provider, managed security service provider, we're in Lafayette, Louisiana, so um, in the southern part of the country. Uh, and we pretty much have full stack capability from transport all the way up to security services. So we cover a lot of ground. Um, and we're also pretty heavy into operations development. So we do a lot of software development. Cool. Which is going to play into the discussion. That's going to play into the discussion today, Robert. We, yeah. You and, I, we've, you and I have talked about that in the past, but it'll be an interesting. Well, we have talked about artificial intelligence and uh, didn't, um, you know, that's why I uh, asked you to be on the show today because right. I know that you've got, I mean, I've got a, a you know, a curiosity. I'm still kind of in that learning mode, uh, but give us a little, you know, but uh, Bob, it sounds like you've got some good experience with AI. Can you give us a little background yeah. on what your experience is? Sure, sure. I mean, so the way back background is, is my degrees are in computer science and mathematics. So I've been a software developer since I was a kid, right? Yep. I still write. I still write code to this day. So, you know, learning machines and artificial intelligence. I mean, for me, that's a thirty-year-old trek from where I started on it to where we are now. Neural nets and you know, learning machines and everything like that. So, yeah, I, you know, the, the it's going to be really interesting to have that conversation about. Okay, well, why is it surfaced now, and you know, what kind of value does it represent to an organization, and whatever the different ways? Because I think we can all agree we're gonna we're gonna see a lot of this happening. And we, we see it real time happening on multiple facets of the things that we do. Everything from language processing with large language models to image generation and now video generation. You know, those are all elements that are useful, but the main uses are going to be related to what we're going to be talking about is things like, okay, how these learning machines really um, augment our capabilities as MSPs, right? So, right, right. We you can know, go as deep as you want. It's well, we're gonna try to go as deep <laughs> as we can in the limited time that we have in the next, uh, let's say, twenty-five-ish minutes. Uh, right. Obviously, we can't uh, give everybody a PhD in AI in this uh, short amount of time, but I think we can uh, keep it high level enough for the average MSP to get, you know, to walk away with some good understandings or at least a better understanding of AI. And it's interesting your development uh, background, your computer science degree. It kind of mirrors my own. I got uh, my college degree in computer science was heavy math. I remember in the late 80s in college talking about artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. and then it just kind of went quiet for a lot of years, uh, even though we've seen examples of AI kind of pop up over time. But and then suddenly, like the last two years, it's like, what like what happened here? Why did it suddenly explode? Any, yeah. any feedback there? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, here's the you know, here is the absolute secret that, that you know, is people are trying to find that connection. Right. Why did it happen here recently? Well, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that any AI or learning machines, the, the one thing you have to be able to do to make them any kind of use to be any use at all is you have to train them. And right. what, what does it mean to train a learning machine? Well, it means you got to put enough data through that machine to, for it to be able to build out all these neural networks so that it can draw some connections between all those data elements. Right. And so what's happened in the last four or five years that's made that um, easier to do? Well, you know, the, the consumption based models of computing resources out there like the Azure's and the AWS's, you know, the pricing and the uh, how much it costs you to actually run these processes. That's been continuing to come down, you know, really over the last 10 years, but it's really gotten to be 
you know, economical to be able to run the processors necessary to kind of do this in recent years. And then again, you know, when you look at what OpenAI did, they just basically went to school on the internet, right? They just started pushing all the data they could get their hands on over the internet, which by the way, if you think back a few years ago, five or six years ago, you'd have had a hard time affording the internet connection that would be able to train that thing up in a reasonable amount of time, uh, right? Okay. So, so you got to look at it as it's it's really kind of an equation. How much bandwidth do you have to be able to push the amounts of data necessary to train up the model? Um, and then you've got to compute all that, right? Because there's compute power behind building those neural networks and drawing all those references. So that's got to be some kind of reasonable price. You, you wouldn't have been able, you know, other governments have been able to do this in the past because they can afford to have craze and other really big iron machines to right. work with, right? Um, but why why is it moved down market to us as normal consumers now? It's because the prices have come down on all of the infrastructure mm -hmm. necessary to make that happen. And there's enough data available now through those high bandwidth pipes to be able to train up these models. So that's really what that's the thing that has changed over the last four or five years is the economics of being able to do this. And I, I think I remember OpenAI talking about the fact that they spent about four or five million dollars training up, you know, training up some of the first GBT models to kind of get off the ground. You know, and five, 10 years ago, that would have probably been 25 or 30 million, right? So, I mean, right. you know, from an economic standpoint, especially if you're a startup, which they were, it's got to be plausible. It's got to be something you can actually do economically. So that's my that's my observations as it relates to why is this blowing up all over the place. Now, so it, it sounds like a little bit of Moore's Law kind of at work, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, yeah uh, absolutely. Uh, better processing, you know, faster, right. better processing, cheaper connectivity, cheaper bandwidth, uh, just cheaper everything overall and uh, cheaper, right. faster, better. Uh, and it sounds like we kind of hit that inflection point. Um, right. and, and, and I also, I mean, as a student of AI, as a self-taught student here, um, it, one of the things that impressed upon me, like, you know, when I tried to understand what is AI, right? And it's not just fancy software, but it's, I think what you were saying is it's also like, um, you're training that technology, that software with la very large data sets. Can you, can you expand yeah. on that a little bit? No, that's, you're hundred percent right, Robert. That, look, it's been around neural networks and, you know, the ability to build neural networks has been around for 30 years. Again, you can have, you could have what's essentially a lot of the models that are used today are not fundamentally orders of magnitude different than the ones we had 30 years ago. So what's the difference, right? Well, um, you know, they've gotten to be more efficient. They've been a lot more technology um, generated from academic research about how to build those things efficiently so that, you you know, it takes less compute time and less um, right. okay. bandwidth to do. But fundamentally, the one thing that AI will never, it, it can't, it's only as useful as the amount of data that's been trained on. Mm. That's, and you're 100% you're right when you say, well, that seems like that's really related to Moore's law because it all comes down to how much data I have access to, how quickly can I get it into the system? How quickly can the system metabolize that into a neural network so that all the analysis software can actually go to work on drawing those conclusions? So you're 100 percent right. That's what that is. But fundamentally, these are learning machines and they're they are neural networks and there's no um, <laughs> there's there's no magic there. It's just yeah. like you said, the universe has finally got the resource equation right and it's economical to do. Yeah, yep. so I, I saw a graphic about this uh, that helped me understand it. And I guess, you know, uh, some layman's terms here. It's, you know, like, how do you how does a piece of software know the difference between a cat and another animal that's not a cat? Right. And it was just feeding it like massive database right. lists that's of right. like and somebody sitting there and saying this is a cat. This is not like a mere cat, even though it sounds like a cat is not a cat. Right. This dog or puppy is not a cat. And it was just feeding it this massive quantity yeah. of data. And even that, there's still failure rates. Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, because again, what are they doing? They're building a statistical model of what a cat is, right? right. I mean, that's basically what they're doing. And so when they view an image, they're taking that image just like we do as humans and looking at it. It's just that our minds are so far advanced compared to what neural networks can do even today, just by the amount of, it's, it's, it's not even gigaflops, it's, Right. Google, whatever that big number is, is past trillions. It's it's one of the huge flops, you know, yep. processing time that we have sitting on top of our shoulders. Um, and that's what allows us to do a much more efficient job. And it's a much more efficient machine, by the way, how it processes data than mine. Because it's both chemical and electrical, whereas you know, it's different. So yeah. That's it's all about the probabilities. 
is that a cat? Well, it probably is because it meets all of these, you know, it meets all of these things that have been told to us that are cat. That Correct. Cat. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, and I know some people that can't tell the difference between a cat and a, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so let, we've been speaking kind of academically, which I think is yeah. really important. I mean, that's the way my brain works is I want to understand the theory before I can understand, you know, the practical uses of that. Uh, but right. obviously, you know, because we don't have hours here, um, right. I want to talk about the practicality or practical uses or even the effect on MSPs. So specifically for MSPs, how does AI affect our business? And um, the services that we offer, how we offer them, will that change with AI? And maybe even cite some examples of what you're seeing. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's you could, you're already starting to see it, right? Just about every, um, every person who's a vendor that generates software for a system for us as MSPs or MSSPs, Almost every one of them have mentioned the fact that they're now going to employ AI, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the reality that the reality is there were a lot of them that had neural networks and learning machines built into their software before. It's right. just it wasn't a it that wasn't sexy to talk about, you know, or it wasn't three years it ago. Didn't have that label, yeah. Right, right, right. It wasn't it wasn't something everybody in the market is now attributing a huge amount of value to. When you have a company like OpenAI get into the billions of valuation, then everybody else who's a marketing person says, "Hey, we should use that term." Yeah. as often as possible but the reality is is that all, you know a great many of our systems in, in the case of an mssp for sure like the sim software that you use and the soar software that you use those have all been employing learning machines from the beginning right and it's right. always just been a question of how much data do you have to to use in those situations and now people you know ai comes in a lot of flavors like you were kind of alluding to before right and these special, the ones that are going to be the ones that are the most predominant out there are going to be special purpose learning machines, right? Special purpose AI that's in a piece of software that is looking for a, a finite set of things that it's observing and reporting on. And it will only be, it, it won't be a mile wide and an inch deep. It'll be an inch wide and a mile deep right. for a specific task, right? And those I, are what I think we're going to see surfacing and being more useful to us over time is where they've really built those learning machines in to connect the dots between multiple data sources. Right. So I understand the term for that is artificial narrow intelligence, meaning, like you said, it's an inch wide and a That's mile. Right. Deep. Um, right. And the one example that I read about was, and I'm drawing a blank on the company name, uh, but it was a bunch of Stanford, uh, Stanford um, uh, uh, st uh, grad students who created this AI uh, by putting a camera on the back of a farm tractor to discern the difference between legitimate plants that you wanted to cultivate yes. and weeds. And then right. if it spotted a weed, it would uh, like almost like with a water pistol, kind of just shoot the herbicide right on the weed, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, like they weren't, they didn't, they hardly even went to market and they sold the company for like 300 million bucks to uh, John Deere. It was, um, again, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but not important, but that's an example of narrow intelligence where, where it can, it just can do that one thing efficiently well. And right. I, you know, as an MSP, I'm wondering like, how is that affecting my business? What, like, and you mentioned some vendors that are using that technology. Um, but I'm wondering, and this kind of gets into my next question. Um, I'm concerned here in my company um, do I need to become an AI consultant or an expert? Do I need to start advising my customer on what sort of uh, narrow intelligence applications my customers ought to be using? What, what do you what do you, do you get a sense there about what we should be doing or where where we're headed? Uh, you're 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 on to the point that's the most important point right now. Everyone needs to be absorbing as much as they possibly can about the state of the science today. Because quite literally in 30 days, it's a whole different beast, right? Yeah. So you have to, and it, by the way, that's not going to change. That's We're going to be riding that curb from here on out. Um, so that it could literally change drastically in six months, right? It, it literally could. It has. We've seen that already. Yeah. Um, so what does that mean? It means you've got to get fluent with it and you've got to learn. You've got to understand it. You've got to use it and you, and you need to be familiar with it and look at all the other ways that it's being used. And what does that mean? That means you got to be a technology expert, which is what we are by default anyway, right? So right. the fact is, we have to understand it for ourselves when we because we run very complex businesses, MSPs, right? I mean, we're messing with 
so many dimensions of, of technical operations across the board. Um, we, by default, have to just be in so many ecosystems to a, to a really detailed level that that makes us subject matter experts. And this is not this is going to be right on top of that. We're going to we're going to see improvements in efficiency and you know how SD WANs you know, stabilize themselves across multiple data sources. You can see this coming a mile away, right? right? Yeah, yeah. You know, because, you know, because, you know, every, all the infrastructure guys are building, you know, main connection points for all of those devices. So the data is at least collected in one place. Well, then you know what that means. That data is going to be used to train up special narrow field AI, you know, applications. And then they're going to really start being able to do some of the grunt work that we're having these real people to do. That's going to happen. So that not only applies to us, but that applies to the enterprises that we're going to be talking to as well. And I'll tell you the other thing that's really interesting, Robert, is that right now leaders of these enterprises are crying out for somebody to tell them, hey, how am I supposed to run, how am I supposed to lead my organization with this new 800 pound gorilla on my front lawn, you know, which is large language models and AI. They don't have anybody to turn to. There's right, there's no share group or nothing. No. <laughs> right. It's all new so front here, isn't it? Yeah, it a hundred percent. It hundred percent is. Now I've been fortunate that during my time of growing up in technology, it has always been a pace of change that was so drastic that most people just can't live in that ecosystem, right? Yeah. It's so fastly changing. Well, now we're on this exponential curve as it relates to these software systems like AI, it's only going to get worse. And people are going to need someone like you and I who can explain to them in layman's terms, hey, you know what this, don't worry about what it's called, but what it's doing for you or is the following things. Yes. And here's the value to your organization by employing that, right? Um, here's what it saves you. Here's what it creates for you. Here are the opportunities it creates. So yeah, it just so happens to, to use AI to get that outcome right. that you're- That's correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I uh, the the joke that I've always told, and I don't know if it's a joke, it's more of a kind of a geeky thing, but I've, I used to tell clients all the time, I don't care if that piece of software runs on a Timex wristwatch. If that's what it runs on, that's what it runs on, right? Let's not worry about whether it's a PC, a Mac or a mainframe or a AS400, like right. let's, let's figure out what the what the outcome needs to be and then we'll figure that's out what the hardware it. is. So so let's not um, get caught up in terms like, mm -hmm. oh, this thing is AI powered. Like, okay, that's cool, um, but does it, achieve the objective that you need for the business yeah no you're 100 right it's all about outcomes that's the only thing that really matters what difference does it make what's underneath the hood it's yeah. all about you know it's all about where it gets you in the end yeah. and that's that's that is going to be important we're going to have to explain that a lot over the next five years we're going to be spending a lot of our time saying yes i know everyone's excited and they're hopping up and down like frogs about this but here's what that <laughs> actually means and pro you know from a from a outcome standpoint what does that really mean right um the same with like what happened with large language models everybody was like going nuts about the large language model you know the biggest benefit to me that large language models presents is the ability what? to use standard language to ask a software system right to give you a right. result that's we've been waiting on that everybody who's ever been a star trek fan has always been waiting for the point where you can say hey computer can you tell me what the average weight of a sparrow is in south america i'd really like to know that right and then run <laughs> off and bring that back to you right that is the biggest benefit to me is this, the, the, at least these early stage developments, is these ability to use plain text and vocalize and, and ask right. the system to give you results. So that's just, it's, what, making, it's making the yeah. interface and the interaction a lot more right. efficient, right? Yeah, 100%. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think that's some of the dangers, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, in a minute or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some questions around dangers, but um, but I think some of the misperceptions that happen is because something like a chat GPT co-pilot, some of these large language model models, or when you're uh, talking to Amazon Alexa or Siri, uh, there's this mimicry of human interaction, but that's exactly right. what it is, just mimicry, right? So right. I think a right. lot of people, and maybe you can touch on this for us a little bit, is confuse yeah. that with like super intelligence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, here's, the, it takes, and again, I have to go back to a human brain, right? The amount of processing power that a human brain has. We're, we're, we don't have the capabilities today to generate the number of transactions per second to even get close to what a human brain is, which, and to date, we've never found any other technology from a you know, standard technology standpoint that can reproduce that yet. Now, yep. yeah. <laughs> what, what, what may get us there, maybe quantum computing at some point might get That's us there. I've heard, yeah. But, you know, but we got to, because it's just the raw horsepower to, to 
be able to do it and the speed to do it. But we're still a long ways off on that front. So we, right. we really are. So, um, you know, that's that's the underlying tension with that. And by the way, a model, uh, you know, these intelligence models are only as good as the data they're fed into them. We see this all the time, right? Right. And and the reason people say, well, you know, it, it gives me funny answers sometimes, which which we call hallucinations, right? Well, why does it do that? It's because it doesn't actually know if the answer is right or not. It just knows what the right answer should look like. Right. right? So it's it's what it does is it says, okay, well, the right answer should be, you know, look like sort of this. And so it goes and builds that structure, that probability mm -hmm. structure, um, you know, using all the probability structure about how to connect English language words together to get a meaning across. It does all that instantaneous and then hands you back a response. And sometimes those responses are insightful. And sometimes, you know, they're, they're not. Not Alice, in, Alice in Wonderland, right? You're yeah. wondering, okay. <laughs> How does well, that, that work? forced me. I mean, um, and again, like this, this one topic alone could be 15, 20 minutes, but oh, it forced yeah. me to create a policy here internally for my team right. to say, hey, you're allowed to use AI tools, but you need to check and validate results. You can't just yeah. assume that the results yeah. that you're getting back, especially if this is client facing or we're using it for, you know, if you're just, you know, goofing around or just, you know, looking a you know, hey, co-pilot, soften up this email that I'm about to send, you know, use a better tone. I mean, they can evaluate that. But, you know, if, if you're producing real results that are going to drive a decision or represent the quality of our, you need to validate that, right? Because um, <laughs> yeah. right. I'd be concerned as any business about hallucination. Um, so let's, um, you know, maybe bring it back to the MS, you know, real world MSP. And I'm thinking, you know, I've got a, I've got a great intern here, super smart. I've been talking to him about a little bit about AI, getting AI in his head. And so okay. what sort of AI related skills do you see the new modern workforce need to succeed? And maybe even within an MSP, like if you were hiring a tech, um, would you be looking for uh, AI skills and what skills would you be looking for? Yeah, I mean, at this point, at the stage we're in right now, we're not going to be there. You know, the, the universities are not putting out artificial intelligence students in any kind of volume right now. Right. So everybody's right. going to have their own personal experience with it. Even computer science students get just a smattering of it. So that, there's a difference between understanding the underlying technology and, make, and then making it produce. Something. So right. I don't try to find someone with a deep history. I don't I, I find that that's not really that much use, really. What I do teach them, though, what we do spend time on is I teach them how to ask these models in the correct way. What is commonly known as prompt engineering. Prompting, yeah, which, thank you. So how, how to actually build these complex prompts. As a programmer, you can actually stack your the construction of your prompt in such a way that you can keep any of these language models from giving you things that you use, reusing words that you can spot right away that a language, large language model uses repeatedly. You can you can tell it to write, I didn't, most people don't know this, but you can actually write a few documents in your own hand, you know, on a computer, you can feed those in to chat GPT and say, hey, I want you to analyze this and I want you to build me the variables that I would need to give back to you so that when I when I want an article produced, it sounds like me and follows my language. Right, right, right. right, and, right. So, and that that's just a, that's just a prompt engineering element. That once you feed it in there and get your numbers back, you know, there'll be numbers for humor. There'll be numbers for seriousness. There'll be, number, you know, there's little bitty parameters for all those things. Hmm. There's about 35 different parameters that you can reference at today, which will expand beyond recognition later. But at, at this point, you can characterize how you want the, that output to become. And that's really important if you're going to use as a company, if you're going to use this in any sort of application capacity, you need to build whatever your standardized company prompt structure is and give these interns just the area to ask the basic question about what it is they're trying to get. Right. Because it will help them not only get back what they're looking for, but also in such a way that it sounds and feels and looks like. So it also company. sounds like experience is part yeah. of that prompting, like knowing what the right questions are to ask to begin with. Yes. Yeah, right. absolutely. It, 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 interesting little article or uh, post I saw on LinkedIn yesterday. It was this guy says, oh, I was asking this large language model. Here's a problem with large languages. They can't do math. And he says, I put five rugs outside. How long does it take for those five rugs to dry? And so it comes and, you know, gave an answer. It says, OK, well, I got five rugs outside. How long does it take to dry? And then it, if I put 20 rugs outside, how long would that take to dry? <laughs> so, but the 
But what so, and the large language model came back with a with an answer that wasn't mathematically correct. Yeah. And then one of one of the other people on LinkedIn says, Yeah, but here's here's what you unintentionally did. When you said that, hey, I, I put five rugs in my yard, how long it takes them to dry, and then how long would it take to dry 20? You implied that you only had room for five rugs in the oh, yard. Right. And yeah. so that you're gonna have to and he says, so if you would have asked the prompt a different way that, hey, my yard, I have infinite yard and I dry my rugs, five rugs. How long does it take? And then how long would it take to do 20? It came back and says, well, it's going to take the same amount of time. Same amount of time. Other, other, other than there may be humidity in the air from the previous ones, right? So it might, <laughs> <laughs> right? So if you ask it correctly, right? Because a lot of people don't understand by doing that, you inferred that you had an area restriction that it took into account and gave you an answer. That didn't right. match what mentally you really thought was going to be there. And that is the complexity of dealing with these language models. You have to be very precise and minimize the complexity of how you ask these things to get the right results. So you're you're 100 percent right. That's it's a big part of how to get real stuff out of these models that you can use. Right. right? It's I think it's important that we learn how to use the tools. And there might be a little, at least initially, my thought was there was a little too much um credence given to its ability to produce answers for you. Like it was just some sort of like either magic eight ball or, you know, just right. this machine right. that could just spit out volumes of correct data. And then I started to realize like, wait a minute, I'm asking this thing questions that I'm a subject matter expert in. And these answers are like, you know, wah, wah, like not so, <laughs> right. not so hot. Right. Right. Uh, and yeah. then I realized that maybe I'm not asking it correctly. Or I had to refine my question. Right. It forced me yes. to start asking it better questions. Um, yes. Oddly enough, I felt like I was being trained. Um, no, you so. are. It's like it's like it's the same way your dogs train you. you yeah. About walking and feeding yeah. them and everything. They, they do the uh, same thing. I'm a cat guy and, you know, oh. cats have humans. Uh, 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 people have dogs, <laughs> cats have humans. So I, I'm, right. I'm, I'm well domesticated in that regard. <laughs> um, so let's, um, one, one maybe last question here. I don't know, maybe we sure. can squeeze in another, but um, I'm thinking about uh, the dark side of AI yeah. and I'm concerned about what the bad guys are going to start doing with it. And especially in terms of cybersecurity. Do oh, you have any thoughts or opinions about oh, yeah. what we may be seeing? Well, I mean, you know, the obvious things are going to be that, you know, phishing, since eight out of 10, you know, incursions are kind of some sort of a phishing yep. exercise, right? So that's that's obviously business email compromise. That's the reason the numbers are rising on that front and other ones are, are falling behind because, mm -hmm. you know, they got a lot better tools to try and pull that off. And, and I don't remember, if it, I think it was a Japanese company that got, Hit with a business email compromise, but what they did is they deep faked the CFO from an image standpoint. Oh, I got, heard him in that that, yeah. got him in a conference call. Yeah, I heard that. Told, yeah. told him to wire all this money, and it was the CFO's image talking to him. And culturally, you know, there are certain places in the world that culturally you don't question, you know, the command and control structure in an organization. Right. You just do what they say as quickly as possible. And I think whoever crafted this attack understood that and used the exact right method to pull this off but when you think about the dangers involved and what could be done by these uh, malicious people this that's the thing we're going to have to be on the lookout for because it, is robert really talking to bob right now or not right i mean it's me i swear are, i swear it's me <laughs> right right but that's that's one of the dangers clearly right and the other is is that, and everybody knows this as well being careful about what data you were you, know, you put into a you know large language model right because because you don't at that point, you're almost releasing control of it by it. It's going to use that to train itself up unless you overtly say, hey, I don't want you to retain this. Again, a little bit of prompt engineering will keep yep. those kinds of things from happening. But those are clearly dangerous situations, too. Right. So I would between the between the business email compromise increases and, and the deep fakes on the videos and you know, all those kinds. Of, those are all the elements that we're going to be fighting here probably over the next year a lot more frequently. Well, it's making our industry really interesting to uh, operate yeah. in. I can almost hear some people, uh, some MSPs going, you know what? Like maybe it's time to get out, you know? Just, <laughs> well, cyber, it's getting harder. It's certainly getting, I mean, cybersecurity <laughs> seemed like this, you know, this massive problem for us. And you right. know, there's a lot of people like, you know, managing and dealing with this and some very, very well, by the way. Um, I know yeah. a lot of yeah my counterparts out there are doing a great job with it. Now throw in AI and it's like, oh my goodness, I got another, you know, 
like what else are we going to be doing here? Um, right. you know, what, what else is going to complicate this business even further? And you touched on something I'm kind of hoping, and maybe we'll close on this is, and there's the word close, uh, on closed versus open AI. And what's the danger there of using open AI systems, especially if, and I think you kind of alluded to this about feeding it data. Yeah, that's really, you know, that's the thing that you can do inadvertently if you're not really familiar with the technology, right? So in, in these open systems, they take all input that's brought into the system, they take that and they use that to train with, right? So your information can, if not, if you don't do something overt to stop this from happening, then it can be subsumed into that engine and in a learned, a learned piece of information. So technically somebody could come behind you and say, hey, Company XYZ, tell me any projects that they've been working on or anything lately, <laughs> right? If it's an open AI and that stuff is in there and it's got yep. reference to you and you put it in there that way, it's just going to regurgitate what it's got in its engine, right? It doesn't, right. Know. It, it doesn't know that that should, right. should be, oh, that's kind of right. private information. I probably shouldn't, yeah. you know, it just no. doesn't know, right? Right, right. So it's all about being very careful about that. About and Now, closed AI systems, which you can get your own models your own language models or you can even get your own language models but you can also get other ai modules and again you got to train them up but those are in your control and yeah. you know in your purview and you know they have to be protected like any other information system that's a part of your organization but you can use them you can use them to really train up the um your, your institutional knowledge of your organization it's sort of a really great way to build up your own artificial intelligence knowledge base for how everything works inside the organization, which helps right. you be efficient. But those are closed systems where you have control of yeah. where that data is and who's able to get access. So to as it. the name implies, open AI is a place that as a lawyer, I should not be feeding it actual court document or maybe court documents yeah. is okay because that might be public. But you oh, know, yeah, confidential right. information about my clients or That's I right. as an MSP should not be uploading my customer list yeah. to it and ask it to do some analysis. But from what I understand, a product like Microsoft Copilot, and again, I'm an amateur here, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. I understand that's a closed architecture. Is that, do you? Do you... Well, it, it, it is. It, it's closed inside of your enterprise, you know, which is which is great. I mean, that's that's a, that's a an advantage of yes. using Copilot in that situation. As long as somebody doesn't break into Microsoft and get into their code base, it's, uh, you know, right. it's fine. You know, I mean, it is what it is. So you yeah. just gotta remember that, you know, there's nobody, nobody is, um, nobody is in, you know, doesn't have to worry about these issues. Everybody does. Right. So right. again, maybe it's not that big a risk, but it's still something to consider. I mean, everything we do is a risk. There's no riskless work in our universe anymore. Right? You so, want to protect that machine, yeah. power cord buried in concrete, That's right. right? That's yeah. right. And it's, and it's useless as hell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now it's completely useless. So as long yeah. as we're yeah. connected in some way that data can get out there. Well, uh, Bob, I really wish I could talk to you forever about this stuff and maybe we <laughs> yeah. might do some of this at an upcoming conference. Yeah. yeah um, happy to. Uh, I totally love this topic and wish we had more time, but that brings us to the end of our discussion on AI. Is this a fad or is this the new world order? Bob, thank you again for joining me today and helping lift our industry by sharing your wisdom and experience on this topic. Very much appreciate that. How can people reach you, Bob? Uh, you can you can find me on LinkedIn, Robert Miller, Global Data Systems. You can do that. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay, cool. Uh, so thanks to everyone for tuning into our series, Game Changers, Innovative Thinkers in the MSP Space, graciously sponsored and presented by Axient. Uh, if you would like to learn more about their awesome BCDR products, you can contact sales or visit their uh, website. You can uh, sign up for a free trial, uh, triplewdub.axient.com. Just let them know that Robert, I sent you, uh, and they'll be happy to uh, uh, assist you. So until next time, live long and prosper.